The knot is the secret of it. We have to put it on the lower left jaw. And if we have it on that side, when he falls, it finishes under the chin and throws the chin back. But if the knot is on the right hand side, it would finish behind his neck and throw his neck forward, which would be strangulation. He might live on the rope a quarter of an hour then. If you put the knot on the left side, it finishes up in front and throws the chin back and breaks the spinal cord. Most murders uh, are in a flash, you know, they're seconds. It's, uh, most of them aren't thought of or premeditated or anything like that, you know, it's just boop, and that's it. You know, somebody's dead and then it's hell, what's happened? But in that, in that flash, who thinks that they're going to be hung? Australian history is inextricably linked with the grim story of the rope. The penal colony's first hanging in 1788 was a grisly spectacle attended by the entire population. The last was a private affair, complete with macabre, gilt-edged invitations. This is the story of the last man hanged in Australia. He was Ronald Joseph Ryan. There were 14 of us pressmen present, representing the people at what was still in effect a public execution. I was writing for the Sydney Sun, a better paper then than it became. I watched him die at 8 o'clock on the morning of February 3rd, 1967, in Her Majesty's Prison, Pentridge, Melbourne. Good morning, gentlemen. At exactly 7.45am, we shall leave here and proceed at a leisurely pace to D Division. Have any of you gentlemen got cameras with you? Understand, there are to be no cameras and no tape recorders. We mean it. The grim and squalid scene is as clear to me now as it was in the hours after the event, and I will live with it until my own time comes to die. Perhaps the imprint went deeper because I didn't need to be there. My editor had told me to make up my own mind whether or not to attend, and that in any case, my paper wouldn't publish an eyewitness story because it didn't want to profit from an execution to which it was absolutely opposed. Morbid curiosity had nothing to do with my decision to be present. If he was to be the last man hanged in this country, didn't he deserve the respect of a silent audience to mark his passing and tell his story? Was he so very different to me? He lived, he breathed, had a family he loved, he deserved something, was owed something. Dignity, respect maybe. If Ryan was predestined for the rope, he couldn't have had a better pedigree. Irish Catholic, working class, an alcoholic father who died of miner's lung, brought up in desperate poverty and sent to a Catholic boy's home at an early age. He ran away at 14 and was soon working in a variety of jobs to support his widowed mother and three sisters. Sleeper cutter, rabbit trapper, kangaroo shooter. He was known and well liked in Sunbury and Balranald, but moved to Melbourne, where at 23 he married the daughter of the mayor of Hawthorne, in the language of the day, above his station in life. I met Ron when I was about 19 down on the Yarra River in Melbourne. We, girlfriend and I went down to a ferry. And uh, one of them you had afternoon tea and another one there was dancing. And we decided to go on the dancing one. And that's where I met Ron. So I met him for a couple of weeks and I just knew straight away that he was the man I wanted. He's a bloke you could very easily like. Very easily like. Twelve months after uh, we were married we had our first daughter. Um, two years later than that, we had our second daughter. He was the sort of guy that... Two years again, we had our third daughter. He had a lot of respect for once you did get to know him, once you just knew... Ron was a marvellous father. Just exactly the sort of person he was. 
and uh, he was intelligent. He was, um, you know, he was, he was just an, an ordinary bloke. He was never sorry for himself, and I've acted for a lot of murderers and been in condemned cells with others. I've never seen anybody who took his fate like Ryan. And somehow, he endeared himself to me. I know the, the rule at the bar is you don't get emotionally involved with a client. I couldn't fail with Ryan. I couldn't help liking him. He felt he wanted to give me the world. And I didn't want the world. All I wanted was a happy, normal, normal family. But Ron started his heavily, heavy gambling. He was always a gambler. But he started gambling very, very heavy and losing. He had so much potential. I felt he could have gone so anyway. he had to get money some way. Uh, first, I met him in 1961 when he was uh, sent to Bendigo, the Bendigo Training Prison. I happened to be governor there at the time. And uh, it wasn't very long after he'd been there that I soon realised that he was above average. He um, got into uh, very heavily into education. He did his leaving. He did his matric. Uh, he was a member of the drama group. He was uh, doing a correspondence course in accountancy. And um, he earned every day of his remission. He was serving an eight and a half years with a three and a half at the time. His parole officer described him as an intelligent, philosophical man of potential, with dignity and self-respect. He had a great sense of family, didn't let a mate down, and never squealed or cringed. Ryan's life of crime has often been overstated. The truth is, he was strictly small-time. Bad checks, break-enter and steal, crimes of property, not violence. He stole quantities of clothing, footwear, paint, typewriters and men's suits robbed some safes, but it was enough to bring Pentridge prison and the collapse of his marriage. When his wife filed for divorce, Ryan began planning his escape. I think he loved the woman very deeply. Uh, he was very attached to his kids. Uh, I'd say that would have been, that was one of the big things that, that hurt him in the jail was, I don't think they were allowed to come and see him. I think he was in the same mental situation that I was when, at the time of the divorce, that he, he was mixed up and he escaped. He didn't, he wanted to contact me. Oh, no one will convince me otherwise of that. I, I suppose that heavens, he was 41 then, he'd be close to 60 by the time he got out of jail. All up, by the time they'd, they'd finished with him. So, uh, when you're 40, you know, 60, there's not all that much blinking left. And uh, I think he was just, he wanted out. On December 19th, 1965, while serving a sentence of eight years, Ryan broke out of Pentridge Prison with an associate, Peter Walker. The human's like any animal, and we all are. There are some dogs that you can tie up, put on a chain, and they'll sit down and lick your boots. There are others, you put them on a chain, they'll break their bloody necks to get off. Well, that's what Ron was like. Ron didn't like being locked up. Right. I didn't like being locked up. The car park, come on, quick! Firstly, I'm quite sure that it wasn't planned to get hold of a gun. But they had to go up on a tower to have the gate opened that they were going to escape through because the control was up in the tower and there was a water up there. And when I got up there, they found a, a gun um, beside the wall. Now, they had to pick up the gun, and this wasn't planned, because if they hadn't, the water would have, and that would have been the end of their escape. Where are they? Where are they? Come here, monkey, near the trees. Where are they on the weapons? Don't you move, I'll stop you! Yes! Robert, the boss off, why the hell? Peter, go Sydney Road. I'll go Bell Street, see if we can get one. After they got outside, the two separated and Walker went to hide behind the wall of the Catholic Church because he was 
directly in the line of fire of a warder in another tower. And he was crouched down hiding. I believe he abandoned the thought of uh, getting away with Ryan at that point. And when Hodson approached him, he stood up and according to the evidence, surrendered, dropping the pipe that he then held. And Hodson picked up the pipe and started to hit him with it. And Walker ran screaming Ryan's name, running up towards Ryan. Ryan! And it was at this point that somebody shot Hodson. Peter! Said bang. A shot you went off? Uh, George Hodson was on the ground. Just general confusion. We didn't realise that there was, you know, anybody shot until we heard the news that night. And uh, quite frankly, we didn't believe it at first. I was getting ready to go down to the beach with the family and uh, the alarm bells went off. And of course, I immediately grabbed a shirt and flew for the gate and uh, ran out through the gate onto the uh, tram tracks where I could see an officer lying on the tram tracks. And when I got to him, I realised it was uh, Prison Officer Hudson. He was uh, still alive, but he was badly hurt. Warder George Hodson received his fatal wound at 2.20 p.m. A massive manhunt was soon underway. Ryan and Walker were at large for 18 days. While on the run, they robbed a bank. A large reward was posted. A man named Henderson recognised Ryan and suggested to Walker they turn him in. Walker shot him dead. It was a costly thing. It cost Hodson his life. It cost Henderson his life, it cost Ron O'Brien his life. So it was a very costly thing. It cost me years and years in jail. But it's, you know, it's, oh, how would you put it? It's a long time, bloody long time. The two men were finally recaptured in Sydney on January 5th, 1966. They were brought back to Melbourne to stand trial for the murder of George Hodson. The Ryan case immediately attracted the attention of Sir Henry Bolte, Victoria's longest serving Premier. He made his thinking very clear when he said that murder of a prison officer, a figure of authority, was a different category of crime than ordinary murder. This was an escape rather than a murder. The, the escape, as I suggest, has happened before to him. He's unlucky, he went wrong. But it wasn't a vicious murder, killing an old lady, doing terrible things to her body, or kids. It had none of those score qualities. It was a little game battler that had toddled off um, into the sunset, so to speak, with Walker. Um, we didn't go with the intentions of taking a gun and killing somebody and, and the uh, rest of it. It was uh, a fair sort of game of who could find who first and who could get away best. That got bulged up. Uh, it didn't have the nastiness, and therefore it wasn't the classical case where you're getting rid of an excretion on society. Doubts remain about Ryan's guilt. Thirteen eyewitnesses testified that they saw Ryan fire. Some saw his shoulder recoil, some saw his smoking gun. But the M1 was designed to be used by a soldier in the field. It fired smokeless rounds and was virtually recoilless. Warders were issued with eight rounds seven were recovered. Ryan always claimed that the eighth bullet would be found in Warder Helmut Langer's tower. Langer's own testimony supported this, but a search found nothing. Sometime after Ryan's execution, in a seemingly unrelated incident, Warder Helmut Langer committed suicide within Pentridge Prison. The bullet that killed George Hodson passed through his body and was never found. Sydney Road was combed meticulously for the empty cartridge case that could have proved Ryan fired. It too was never found. Even if Ryan fired, the defence maintained the passage of the bullet through the body indicated it had been fired from an elevated position. Ryan, five foot eight inches tall, could not have fired downward on Hodson, six foot one. 
the whole basis of the Crown and every Crown witness that got up at that trial was there was one shot fired. The only person that said that they fired a weapon out on that street was a prison officer. I mean, you know, let's face it, if somebody says they fired a gun, they fired it. I know uh, the chief prosecutor, what's his name? Mr Murray, I think it was. He gave a hypothetical thing out in, in, to the jury that if you're driving past a paddock or something and you see a, a rabbit run across that paddock and you see a man in that paddock with a gun and you hear a bang and you see the rabbit fall over, then you would say, I, sh I saw him shoot the rabbit. But what if there's, like there was out on Sydney Road, there were more people with guns than just Ronald Ryan. There was guns in the towers. There was guns coming up through from the front gate. There were people running around that road with, with guns in their hands. I mean, if you were driving down the road in the same hypothetical case and you saw a rabbit run across a paddock and a man in a paddock with a gun and you heard a bang, what if there was a man behind a bush, a second man with a gun or a third man with a gun and they'd fired? Would you still come out with, you saw the man shoot the rabbit? You, the only person you were looking at. The only person that wasn't in a uniform with a gun. The only man that looked like he must have been illegally out there with a gun was Ronald Ryan. So they're looking at him. They're focused on him. I mean, suggestion would automatically come to the head, sort of, bang, he's got a gun. He fired. Despite the apparent inconsistencies of the evidence, Ryan was convicted of murder and Walker of manslaughter. There have been, I've been told, ill-informed people who blame me for the execution of Ryan. I'd like to make it perfectly clear in those days before the Act was amended in the 70s that if a judge tried a man for murder and if he was convicted, the judge had no optional alternative. He had to sentence him to death. It was the only uh, punishment he could inflict. There hadn't been a hanging in Victoria for 16 years. Since then, all 35 murderers under sentence of death had been reprieved. Ryan seemed more worthy of mercy than many of those who'd been allowed to live. The decision rested with Sir Henry Bolte and his cabinet, yet it was never put to the vote. Bolte simply pushed the decision through in the same bullying style that had kept him at the top for 11 years. Ryan would hang. I had an invitation to Mr. Keith Willey, representing the Sydney Sun, but my paper wouldn't publish. Silent protest, they said. Would I go to Melbourne anyway and cover the growing crisis? Of course I would. I felt I owed it to Ryan, as a member of the community which condemned him. Not to go would have seemed to make him less a human being than an unwanted animal. And then there was Sir Henry, who was, he said, merely upholding the law, but he had reasons of his own. He faced an election in three months and had another reason I could relate to. Long-standing feuds with newspaper editors. Prior to the Ryan matter, uh, a man named Tate had committed an extraordinarily gruesome murder, the Hawthorne Vicarage murder, and uh, in which he did vile things to a, an old lady. And... Uh, uh, Bolte, because he was the sort of person he was, the yokel sneered at by the Melbourne establishment, had to keep on showing them how tough he was. And he determined that he would hang Tate. And the Melbourne Herald uh, decided that he wouldn't. I think the reason why the Ryan hanging is still of interest, as the Kelly execution 110 years ago, that both of those executions were highly political. And that is why Ryan has lived for these years and Kelly has lived over a century. Uh, Henry Bolte said to Graham Perkin, the editor of The Age, a very fine newspaper man who died well before his time, and Graham Perkin told me of Henry's words, you so-and-so has beat me over Tate, I'll beat you over Ryan. And he who laughs last laughs best. Bolte received a big shock when we beat him in the Tate case, we, the Tate um, execution 
wasn't allowed to proceed, and that really infuriated uh, Bolte, and uh, he was waiting for the next cab off the rank, and uh, poor Ryan happened to be the next cab. Sir Henry's round Punchinello face masked his political cunning. Initially thought of as a stopgap leader, he came to dominate the Melbourne establishment by showing the political will to make the hard decisions. In a masterful piece of timing, Sir Henry exploited the approach of the Christmas season, hoping to distract the public from the announcement of Ryan's execution. I think Balti certainly saw political gain in having an execution. I think all the opinion polls show that most people or 70 or 80 percent of people probably favour hanging and he's, he himself said that uh, uh, that a hanging you know, does no harm at all at the ballot box. I think it was something deep within him that he needed to do because at the end of the day if there is one thing that shows an exercise in political power is the fact that you use the coercive powers of the state to take another human life. Now, I didn't want Walker to be in the dock while I was sentencing Ryan to death, and accordingly I told them to take Walker away and hold him outside the court while I sentenced Ryan. And just as he was leaving, um, Ryan leant over and patted him warmly on the back, and I must say that impressed me. You know, being charged with felony murder, they could have very easily found both of us guilty and um, we could have been on the trap door together, the both of us. Ron was not bitter. Ron just took it that that's what had to be, and that was what was planned by the God Almighty. I think Ron had the attitude, your life is planned for, for you from the day you're born. I have that attitude. I mean, how, how many people you have just been sentenced to death, sort of wish you the best, you know. He was a guy who uh, I had to see at intervals, regularly. Uh, there might be an issue in the court that he was fit to plead or unfit to plead, this had to be looked into. But as far as uh, psychiatric uh, matters were concerned, he was not a psychiatric case. He was an ordinary sort of a chap. The nearest I can get to describing him was a sort of James Cagney type of chappy. Uh, if he suddenly burst into a dance or something, or sang some song, I would not have been surprised. And I, my first impression was that he was a real little Aussie battler. I found Ryan a very likeable rogue. I don't think anybody could meet him without liking him. The first time I saw him, his mother was being led out by two nuns uh, from his cell. I didn't know it was his mother, but I guessed it was. And he said to me, did you see that lady going out? I said, yes. He said, that's my mother. She's more interested in saving my soul than my neck. He said, I hope you're not like that. Convicted on March 30th, 1966, Ryan endured a 10-month ordeal as he fought for his life through every legal means. Repeated appeals against his conviction were refused by the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court and the full High Court. Petitions and appeals to the Governor, the Queen and the Privy Council all failed, succeeding only in delaying what seemed inevitable. Letters from at least seven distraught jury members, none of whom thought the sentence would be carried out, never reached the Cabinet. They reached the Governor and the Premier and were ignored. The summer of 67 saw the climax to 10 months of protest. Brian's cause drew support from all walks of life, across political boundaries. The strong links between the Catholic Church and the divided Labour Party, languishing in opposition, were evident on the streets as marches and vigils galvanised public opinion and laid siege to Sir Henry Balti's government. The growing protest movement revealed the power of dissent and civil disobedience and fueled the debate on capital punishment across the country.
G'day, Rob. Hey, Father. Well, I met uh, Ronald Ryan very soon after the Executive Council decided to hang him. And he said to me on that first meeting, I won't come back to the, won't come back to the church for you, nor for my mother, mother, nor for the governor of this jail. And then he added an interesting thing as one knock about to another, nor will I stay away from what Muggs might say. You leave me to myself. Ryan's return to the faith was, he said, approached with the proper humility. He understood the hypocrisy of living one way and dying another, and spent his last months wrestling with his conscience. In the end, with typical good humour, he decided it was a hard religion to live in, but a good one to die in. The one-time altar boy returned to the church. He then decided he'd like to go to the sacrament of penance or confession. So I was too shrewd to offer to hear his confession. I didn't want that restriction put on me. And I suggested to him that Father Vincent Arthur would be a good man for him, a saintly man, worldly wise. Forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. How long has it been since your last confession? I left them together and they were together four hours. And when I went to see him, it had nothing to do with me, his sincerity or his dealings with God, they were his own personal thing. But he said an interesting thing to me. He said, that took more out of me than any bust I've ever done. <laughs> Many congratulated Father Brosnan as the only real friend Ryan had, but he had others. Hardened criminals, men he'd known since his days in Bendigo prison, had a daring plan to break into Pentridge and free Ryan. They had ropes, they had hooks, they had everything. They, they were loaded, they had weapons, they had gelignite, and they knew the routine very well because I paced around there some nights afterwards to see if it could be done, and, and it could have been done all right. There's no question about it. It was set for January 30th, the eve of his execution. Ryan didn't know it, but as he took communion for what he thought was the last time, Justice Stark was ordering an 11th hour stay of execution. It was high drama. As the emotional crowd spilled out of the court, back in Pentridge, Ryan looked up from his prayers and called Father Brosnan to him. That night, which was to be his last on earth, I'd said Mass, and he, uh, straight away at the end of the Mass, he said, would you get the governor? So the governor came post haste and uh, he said, they're coming to get me tonight and I want to stop them. I'm prepared to die. And uh, the, uh, there'd be slaughter here tonight and some of those police and prison officers have got families and dependents. You're dreaming. Anyway, if anyone really were coming in to get you out, I'd be the last person you'd tell. I'm telling you the truth, I swear it. I said, why are you telling me this? I need a pen and paper. And he said, well, I've made my peace with God. He said, I'll never be for, so prepared to die as I am now. And he said, it only mean bloodshed. Anyway, he, um, he told me how it was going to happen. He wrote a note. And uh, this note was to be conveyed to the people concerned and uh, to call it off. The dramatic last minute stay of execution was overturned and a new date was set. Ryan would hang on February 3rd, 1967. This time there'd be no reprieve. Justice Stark had been a gifted advocate and was known as an opponent of the death penalty. His successful defense of Tate years earlier had caused Sir Henry acute personal and political embarrassment. In a bitter irony, Balti now called Stark before the cabinet to give cause why the man he'd sentenced shouldn't hang. The $64 question was, uh, did you agree with the verdict of the jury? And I did. And the decision I had to make was whether I would tell the truth and say, yes, I agreed with the verdict, or whether I would tell a lie and say, no, I didn't, and I could have given reasons. 
uh, agree with the verdict and it was possible that he wasn't guilty, whether this would have swayed those on the cabinet who were undecided and whether that would have saved Ryan's life. I had to balance a man's life against the truth. Ronald Ryan was a burglar for heaven's sake. He wasn't, he wasn't a thrill killer. He had kids of his own. He tried to do the right thing by. He looked after his mother when she was an old lady. And well, I just think that the state got a bit vindictive. The hangman's preparations for Ryan's death were as complete as his victims. A relic of Victorian England known as the hangman's table, compiled by Charles Duff, provided a scale of weights and measures which his latter-day colleague consulted, comparing Ryan's height and weight with those of his unfortunate predecessors of almost a century ago. The gallows trap, idle for 16 years, was oiled and greased. Machinery of traps and nooses, of politics and the law, lacks compassion. So too, it seems, did the man who would pull the lever. A, a lot of it is a blur when I visited Ron uh, after his appeals had been refused because mentally I was really down I just couldn't understand it but I was able to go and see him I don't know for how long whether it be one minute or five minutes I don't know I know little lady I know yeah. well, I'm fine really I'm okay I just got to think of the kids. Yeah, I know. Did you bring them? No, they're at my brother's. It's better that way. Yeah. I've always loved you. Take the kids, change your name and get out of Victoria. Go, just go. It was a, a visit that was never recorded. And I appreciate I'll the person who did it for me. Uh, but it was just so Ron and I could say goodbye to each other. I don't actually remember leaving me. On the Friday following the hanging, um, I received, uh, through a source that I, I can't disclose for ethical reasons, uh, a letter that Ryan had written in uh, H Division uh, on lavatory paper. He'd folded that into uh, 80 folds, and it starts like this. My darling, My wife, darling and wife and daughters, it has been of the utmost, it has been of the utmost concern to me that I have lost with contact you. with you. Through what, Through what to use a dramatic phrase, been has been my darkest hour. hour. It's a letter to his, uh, his wife and daughters, and he, he felt very badly the fact that he hadn't been able to see his daughters presenting a closed and united front to hostile elements and affording each other, as only a family can, comfort and support. This Ryan's extraordinary letter, quoting William Shakespeare and Omar Khayyam, remains an intimate and profoundly moving testimony to his love for his family. But it was suppressed by well-meaning relatives and wouldn't reach them for 25 years. Ryan entrusted another letter to Father Brosnan, which Dorothy received in the days following his death. His letter is carried on me at all times. It's always in my possession. As you can imagine, a lot of it is um, very personal. In his last paragraph, I wish you all the best of life and you may be sure I'll be doing my best from where I may be to watch over you and protect you. Remember I love you. Just be brave, do your best and follow your heart. It's a very, very personal letter. 
nothing. He's just sort of saying what he thinks of the girls. But you could only tell you of certain actions of first. Saying how he went to confession. But and during our marriage would seem amazing. He's thanking Janice, Wendy and Rhonda and myself However, for the love and loyalty. And telling us it hasn't been misplaced. And we know in our own heart it was never misplaced. A love and loyalty is as strong now as when he was alive. Back in those days, I was a young senior officer. And on the night before Ronald Ryan was hanged, I was the officer in charge of the watch. That's the first watch between 4 p.m. and midnight. And part of my duty as the OIC was to visit the many centuries in and around the various divisions of Pentridge Prison. And I guess I got to H Division, that's the maximum security area. I got there about 9 o'clock and I was informed that Father Brosnan was with Ronald Ryan. So I decided I'd go in and but have a chat with Father Brosnan and see Ronald Ryan at the same time. When I was about to leave, Father Brosnan said, Will you come and say a prayer for Ron? To me, of course, it seemed as if time had just suddenly stopped. And then I heard my own voice say, Yes, Father, I will. And all the clocks started ticking again. And I felt good because I felt peace with myself. And I walked out of that division feeling ten foot tall. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then I it was back to the main gate. And what a contrast between the two areas. The observation cell, it was quiet and peaceful. Back at the main gate, the crowd was growing by the hour. Uh, the police were busy manning the barricades, keeping the crowds well away from the main gate. And all available fire hoses were connected and laid out on the ground, just in case the crowd decided to storm the place. But of course, nothing like that happened. And as night wore on, one could sense that a true vigil was taking place outside. When we reached Pentridge, uh, it was a sweltering, hot summer's night. Um, there was a great deal of tension and emotion in the air. The crowd was frustrated, I think angry. They were hoping by their very presence to change the decision at the last moment, but I think all of us knew deep in our hearts that that wasn't going to happen. In a sense, our presence there was part of a a physical protest saying we don't want to be part of this awful thing that's going to happen. Poor oh, Lord, we've all a million things, I suppose. If only we hadn't done this, if only we did that. The sheer stupidity of it, the waste of it, the absolute frustration and despair that there was nothing you could do to help him. You know, this huge machine that you're caught in the middle of. Uh, that the cogs were just going to keep turning and turning and just grind you, and that was it, you know. That he was... Um, well, he, it was just... No hope. On his last night alive, Ryan wrote to those who had fought tirelessly on his behalf. The Anti-Hanging Committee. I take this opportunity to thank you for your unflagging efforts and individual sacrifice. I realise there are critics of some of the methods used, but I ask them not to lose sight of the principles for which you fight. This justifies your using the weapons at hand. Again, the merits or otherwise of my case are merely incidental. My case is merely the catalyst. I state most emphatically that I am not guilty of murder. This adds further justification to your cause. At 
this late stage, it seems that your efforts in my case have been in vain. However, in a broader sense, you have gained a lot. I am confident that your committee is not far from achieving its objective. Then you may well bask in a sense of satisfaction at causing society to take another step in evolution away from the primitive. God never denies us hope or another chance. Why should our earthly judges? Ronald Joseph Ryan. I'd been for a swim early down at St Kilda Beach. I always swam at home. Daily ritual. It had been a stinking night and promised to be a dirty day. I don't know whether Ronald Ryan slept well on his last night. I know that I didn't. A measure of rum in my morning coffee did nothing to steady my nerves. There was this air of nervous nervousness. The best way I can describe it is like uh, just before the grand final in the press box, uh, that excitement of an event about to happen, a lot of camaraderie, a lot of joking, a lot of uh, bullshit going on, carrying on. It and, was very... Uh, uh, shyacking amongst the guys. Very Did, old. I was, I was bloody nervous by then. And smelled something dreadfully of um, Lysol-type smell, like a, one imagined, like the preparation of a, an old hospital during the Crimean War. That sort of feeling you had that... Old I was looking around, taking notes furiously, pretending I was so, you know, so uh, poised when I wasn't. And when I tried to read the notes later, I, it took me hours to decipher some of the words. I just wrote a, a word down. I found that I'd written light, and I remembered how eerie the light seemed. I don't know whether it was my imagination. I found it very odd. Not that I was down there, because I had a job to do, and not that the governor had a job to do, and, and Father Brosnan had a job to do. I could understand that at a level. But the idea of the press being there with tickets, and I, I can understand in an intellectual way that the press have got a job to report these things, but there is something odd about thinking this guy has written through the governor or whoever he writes to and said, can I have a ticket, not for the grand final, but to go to the hanging of another Australian, it, it's weird. The effect it had on me uh, mainly was that for the next few nights I tended to wake up with a start and, and with this image of, of, of Ryan, Ryan looking down at us. Sort of imprinted. And my thought at the time, as I looked up, that hey, this had gone on long enough, you've proved your point, you can stop now. Mind you, they opened, he was hanged 45 seconds early. I'd checked my watch at the 3OW before I went in there, and uh, one of the funny things that sticks in my mind is looking at the clock in the cell block, and it was 45 seconds fast. So, uh, what does it matter? On the day of the execution, I felt dead, and I'm sure my kids did too. All I know is that the three girls and I were together. There was no one else around us. Um, I'd say it was the hardest day of my life, and part of me died that day. But I was lucky I had the girls to carry me through. And that's all there is to it. I couldn't have done it without my girls. Everything was very quiet around the area we were living in, which was very unusual because we were living on a main road. It seems that all of a sudden everything just seemed to go quiet. There was nobody around. It was as if the whole world had stopped when Dad died. And that was a funny way of looking at it, but that's just the way it seemed. Oh, the whole world had stopped. I gave him communion, and then we said uh, part of the rosary in the con in H division where he was held. And then I walked to the gallows, and he went by bus, and we finished the rosary over there. I walked down into the, into the cell, and uh, Ryan's there was officers there with Ryan, four officers and uh, security, and I said to uh, Ryan said to me, rather, he said, you look a bit pale, Gov. 
And I said, well, I'll be OK. And his last words were to me, were, Christ showed us the way to die on the cross, and our Lord forgives sinners. His last words to me, I'll never forget, and I don't say them boastfully, because these could be said by people to people, if they were in the circumstances. Never forget, as long as you live, you were ordained for me. Thank you, Ron. Because then the sun starts coming up and uh, it gets a bit lighter in the cell. And you know the time's getting closer and closer and closer and you're sort of wishing for the man. You're hoping that, you know, something's going to happen in the last minute, but it doesn't. Nothing comes along. And, uh, and then you hear the gates opening and the bloody, the keys rattling and, and you hear them come down and uh, and you hear them taking him away. And it was just waiting, waiting, waiting. And still hoping. Look a bit pale, Gov. I'll be all right. By order of the Supreme Court of Victoria, you, Ronald Joseph Ryan, will at 8 a.m. of this third day of February 1967 be executed within the grounds of Her Majesty's Prison, Pentridge. Preceding your execution, you are permitted to make a short speech if you so wish. It is my duty... Uh, it is the duty of the Sheriff's Office, Melbourne, to preside over your execution and to ensure that proceedings are conducted according to present laws governing capital punishment in Australia. After you have been hanged by the neck until dead, you shall be buried in unconsecrated ground. It is now my solemn duty to see that the sentence of the court is carried out forthwith. Signed by myself, the Sheriff, at the Sheriff's Office, Melbourne, on this, the third day of February, 1967. As he pulled the hood down over, over Ryan's face, which was that bandana thing I was talking about, I saw him leap for the lever. The only way I can describe it is the hangman leap for the lever. Just before the hood came down, Ryan looked down at us and seemed to give a bit of a, a, bit of a smile at us, which I found quite disconcerting. And uh, as the hangman leaped for the lever, I'm, I closed my eyes. It was just too much. And when I, I opened them again, there's an almighty crash. I mean, the, the, the gallows is obviously metal and seemed to bang back against some, some stops. It was a hell of a crash. And then there was just the, when I looked again, the, the rope was just swaying, was creaking. I could hear in a gymnasium and I heard, uh, heard Father Prost. Behind the screen. We commend to thee, O Lord. It was just terrible. The soul of thy servant, Ronald. Awful. 
I mean, the, it was so callous, the, just the deliberate leading of a man and putting a rope around his neck and, the sins and, that he and doing has committed it. In this life, through human frailty, do you, through your merciful goodness, forgive. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The order of these things I can't remember, but I certainly took his pulse. And one of the, the problems that that produced was the pulse was still there. And in a sort of weird way, one thought, maybe I failed. He should be dead. Um, and if I fail, what do I do to repair it? You know, what, what do you normally do if you make a mess of things? Even with your fingers in your ears, one still heard the click of the, the fracture dislocation taking place. It came through your fingers. It, sort of entered your head through uh, other sources in your ears, I think. It's like listening to a sort of an organ in a cathedral, you hear some of it with your feet. It's all very well to be brave from afar. You can put up a placard and say, hang him. But when you're there, when you're close to it, and see the, the planning, the preparation that goes into it, the, the, this coldness, the, the, the brutality of it, it's frightening. It's all very well for Henry Boldy to say, hang this man, but uh, will he get up and pull that lever? I doubt it. I doubt anyone will. And uh, I don't think we have achieved anything because murder, m murders are going on all the time. It's, it's so definite. There's no second chance. If I make a mistake, uh, it's, it's uh, an awful trouble. You can't bring the man back. And uh, also, too, the influence it has on, on everybody is not good. I still have prison officers coming up to me saying, you know, I'm really hung up over that happening way back in 1967. They're not sure whether they're backing the right side, whether they're grieving for the right person. Nobody's quite clear about this. And it's a question of, was it really him who did it? For me, it wasn't a matter whether Ryan was guilty or not. It was the fact that the state itself had demeaned itself and demeaned its own institutions by, by taking a life uh, as a form of retribution, uh, as an exercise which at the end of the day uh, produced incredible tensions within various sections of the community. And there were other alternatives and they could have been exploited and they weren't. And I think we were all demeaned by that. What we did with Ryan, we took a life for a life. Uh, but we were much different. We, Ryan, unlike Ryan, who killed in the spur of the moment, in the heat of the moment, we took a life in a cold-blooded manner. And that's, people have to ponder over that. I think we should ask ourselves questions about that. Are we any better? Are we a better person? Are we better than what Rodham Rand is? We killed a man, so did he. Are we, the, uh, are we a better person for it? I don't think so. The my wife and I, we say the rosary every night, and there isn't a, a night goes by that we don't remember in our prayers. And there has been times when I've needed help, and uh, I've, asked, I've asked Ryan to intercede for me, and I believe he has. Memory is strange. We manufacture what we wish we remembered and obliterate what we need to forget. Guilty or not, the truth is, 
Capital punishment is the murder of a man by the community of his fellows. As I shut my eyes now, I can see again the slight grey figure gazing unflinchingly ahead as he stands on the gallows trap. And I hope and pray no Australian of a future generation is fated to share such a memory. <laughs>